very rarely do you ever get a flawless brew day. Every brew day always has a hiccup, so don't let that uh, deter you from brewing. All right, so we're here for episode three of Homebrew How To. We're gonna jump over to Brian and Tuan, see who we're gonna go see and what we can expect for the day. Yes, yeah, so we're about to go see Carl Hayden. He's got a uh, brew in a bag type setup. Uh, apparently it's a bit of a Franken system, so Tuan here is gonna tell you all about it. Yeah, so Carl has a, I wanna call it a highly engineered system, but uh, he sort of Frankenstein it together, um, sort of an engineer's dream, a brew in a bag system. I think he even has like a Herm system going on through it. Um, a pulley system, uh, so we're gonna get a, we're gonna have a little real treat seeing uh, what all he's put together for this brew. All right, we're here at Carl Hayden's house. He's a member of Cask Home Brewing Group here out of Williamsburg, and um, he's gonna take us through a brew day on his brewing a bag Herm system. Engin highly engineered Frankenstein system. So it's, this is going to be exciting. So let's see what Carl's got to store. Hey guys, my name is Carl Hayden. I started brewing maybe about 2005, six, seven, eight, 2008. After I graduated from college, uh, just was talking with my cousin, sitting in a bar, like how cool it would be to, to brew some beer. And uh, so, you know, we got an extract kit and did that. And we thought, wow, this is the coolest thing ever. And even back then the beers weren't as awesome as they are today. So, uh, you know, after that, it just kind of evolved. The first thing we did this morning was fill up our mash tun with the amount of water that we're gonna need. And we filled up our hot liquor tank to level, it's about 12 gallons right above the top of the Herms coil. And we got that up to a temperature uh, inside the mash tun that we're gonna mash in roughly 170 degrees Fahrenheit. And once everything was set to temperature, uh, Tuan and I mashed in by dumping in the grain, stirring it all up. Uh, and holding the recirculation for now. And the temperature of the grains mixed in with the temperature of the water uh, yielded us a mash temperature of about 156, which is right around our target. So now we're gonna sit here and uh, mash roughly around 156 as best as we can for about an hour. So Carl's uh, mashed in already all of his, uh, his base malt where we're getting all our sugar from. So if we go back to Episode one with Reese, that's basically um, Carl Harris equivalent to Reese's uh, dry malt extract. And uh, they actually just finished uh, mashing in the specialty grains, which is where they're getting all their color, their flavor. Um, so that's that's what we had for Reese doing his, uh, the grains that we had in the muslin bag right, episode well, one. So on our homebrew how-to, we have a featured tradition beer that Brian brewed here. And so he brought us one and he's gonna provide the first round today. Brian, tell us a little bit about what kind of beer we got here. So we got a uh, fresh one now to clean your free Caribbean cruise. It's uh, part of our possible spam series of hazy IPAs. Uh, we've had some fun with this series and names, but uh, this one is brewed with uh, Galaxy, Callista, and Hotel Blanc Cops. So nice big 7.2% hazy double IPA. Let's give it an open. So we're about halfway through our mash process here. The next step is gonna to be to bump up the temperature a little bit, add a little bit more water from our hot liquor tank, and then we're gonna start fly sparging and draining some of this wort into the boil kettle. And that's gonna take about 20, 25 minutes while we heat up that wort and rinse all the sugars off of our grains. We finished our mash and we're slowly transferring it over to the boil kettle while we're fly sparging with hot water on top. This is gonna take probably 20, 25 minutes or so as we're slowly draining out of this mash tun into the boil kettle. Keep that element on. If it gets to too tannish, I'll kill it for you. Thanks, man. So Carl just ran into a, this is a slight problem, but just a great example of very rarely do you ever get a flawless brew day. Every brew day always has a hiccup, so. Don't let that uh, deter you from brewing. As Carl's efficiency came in a little bit lower than he was expecting, so we're doing a little bit of a pseudo reiterated mash. So he's taking that wort from the boil kettle, going back into the mash tun, rinsing those grains off again, getting some more sugar out of it, flipping it back over to the boil kettle. So we just finished with our mash and ran off into the boil kettle. Uh, now we've got a bag full of grains that we can start to raise out of the pot. 
and uh, start to drip slowly the remaining wort out of it. You can hear that starting to drain a little bit. That's a good thing about having these custom bags. There's a very bags will spill over the side. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we just pretty much started to boil. Yeah, we haven't been out to start this is the part where you gotta watch so it doesn't so boil over. So we're brewing, uh, our most important unit in the measure is uh, gravity. So we're measuring how, essentially how much sugar is dissolved into a liquid. So what you just saw Carl using was a refractometer. Um, and that's a way that he can kind of measure the gravity of his work to make sure that we're going to end up having uh, the proper amount of sugar in the work to make sure we have the right ABV in the beer. All right, it's worth saying that uh, on a refractometer, it's sort of a step up from your uh, traditional uh, first home brewer that's going to use a hydrometer so you're going to get sort of the same reading you know a 1.0 whatever whatever um, but uh, you know your refractometer is uh, a little bit more expensive than a hydrometer um, but uh, it is it is a good way to take small samples and get your reading uh, very quickly compared to a hydrometer all right so now we're uh, at a full boil we're going to add the hops and wait for 60 minutes Put it into the hop spider so the hop matter doesn't get into the bottom of the pot. All right, what you see here is a hop spider that Carl's using. And it allows him to add hop additions right into that spider. And it's sort of a filter so it doesn't allow the vegetation of the hops get all into the boil. And uh, it also helps when he's cooling it down and transferring it to the fermenter so he won't get any of that matter into his uh, ferment. Right now, we're just about finished with our boil. And the next thing we have to do is cool down our wort to yeast pitching temperature. In order to do that, we're gonna utilize a plate chiller and our groundwater supply to chill that wort down to about 68 degrees or so, uh, so we can put our yeast in there safely. And what's gonna happen next is while our wort is recirculating through this plate chiller, we're gonna turn on this cold water supply here. And what you'll see is the temperature of the output of this plate chiller drop down continuously until we reach somewhere hopefully around like 60 70 degrees fahrenheit whatever our ground temperature is plus a little bit more to account for the efficiency of the heat exchanger we're going to whirlpool that through our boil kettle for a few minutes to try to collect any hot break material towards the center of it and after that we're going to transfer it into our fermenter but, you know, they have an approach to removing You're transferring beer or wort into your fermenter and it's sealed. Make sure you vent it so that it doesn't explode. So now we've got the output of our pump going to the fermenter. The fermenter is vented. All the ports are sealed up. And we can start to fill our fermenter up. So now we're just uh, sealing off the fermenter. And usually right now is when you pitch your yeast. But what I do here is I uh, cold crash the beer prematurely to sink all of the remaining break material down to the bottom so that I can uh, drain it out before I start the fermentation process. Currently I've got my temperature set up to cool it down to 34 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's already kicked on the glycol pump and it's gonna start pumping cold glycol through my chiller coil. And this should reach a really cold temperature pretty quickly and settle out some of those solids to the bottom of the conical fermenter. So here I'm just hooking up a little CO2 pressure to the fermenter while I cold crash it. You only need about 5 to 10 PSI here to account for the temperature difference. Okay. Now we wait for the glycol chiller to do its thing and cool down this uh, wort to a really cold temperature and cold crash this uh, beer. Last step of the brew day, we're going to raise the temperature of our wort up to fermentation temps. We're going to rehydrate our yeast. We're going to aerate the wort. 
and we're going to put in our tilt hydrometer and pitch the yeast and we're going to seal it up, take about a week and we should be done with fermentation. All right, here we are tonight at Tradition Brewing Company. You just saw all the highlights from the brew day. Carl's going to be here in just a second. And before we jump over to meet with Brian and Tuan to get a little taste of this beer, let's ask him a few questions. Here he comes now. Hey, Carl, what's going on? Reese, how's it going? It's going great, man. Thanks for having us over for the brew day. I see you got the stuff in hand right here. We're going to taste it tonight. I do. Okay, tell me a little what we're going to uh, taste and talk about. So uh, what I brought is a Schwartz beer. It's about five and a quarter percent. It's a black lager. Okay, black lager, and what are, what should we be tasting, or what is uh, what is special about this beer for you? So it's got a little bit of uh, multi characteristic, or actually a lot, depending on how you brew it. So for me, it's somewhere between the smoothness of a pilsner and uh, the malty and uh, roasted flavors that you get, and maybe like a porter or a stout. Awesome. Well, what was your favorite part of homebrew how to on the actual brew day? So uh, I guess my favorite part would probably be having you guys over to uh, watch my brew process and give me a hand and crack a few beers while we wait. Uh, we definitely crack. cracked a few beers, didn't we? And, and there was that one incident where something went a little bit awry and Tuan said there's always an incident in the brew day. Tell us what happened. Yeah, so I've been brewing on the system that I built for about five years or more. And it just so happened that when we were filming and uh, people were watching me brew, uh, one of those crimp connectors inside my electrical panel just finally gave out and uh, I lost power to my pumps for a few minutes. So that was, uh, that was a little stressful for a few minutes there. Well, you and Brian rushed in there and we were able to save a beer. So let's go jump over there, try this thing top. Guys, brought the beer that we made. All right. Got a Schwartz beer. Schwartz beer. About five awesome. and a quarter percent. Ready to crack these things open? Hey, before we crack them open, Carl, thanks for having us over and letting us brew with you. I know it's tough to have uh, folks over when you're brewing, but I uh, appreciate it. Thanks for coming over. Yeah. I think we had a good time. You been practicing? Yeah, I uh, open every can I can with the draft top, actually. Let's do this. All right. I like that sound. So far, so good. Like mm. a pro. Well, so far, the aroma is real nice. I'm getting a lot of roastiness off the top. A little bit of subtle kind of chocolate in the background there, so definitely a fan of the aroma. And a, ti a tiny bit of fruitiness. Not nice not too much, but yeast driven fruitiness. Yeah. There. Flavor's good and clean. Nice subtle chocolate in the background. Yep. Maybe a little bit of like roasted yeah. barley going on in there. Yeah, awesome. And the finish is real nice. Nice crisp finish makes you uh makes you want to keep drinking want to go back for another sip nice yeah. and clean for sure so car reminded us um we had a little hiccup on brew day and uh being able to to kind of have that happen during a brew figure it out get over it keep going with the brew and finish it out get a great beer out of it that was probably my favorite part of the whole thing is there anything you took away from the brew day twice? i mean i think highlighting the hiccup during brew day is always it's a good thing, especially if you're learning from, you know, the homebrew how-to, because every brewer has a hiccup. I don't care who you are, you always have some type of hiccup, and a big hiccup is, you know, what, what we overcame. But my favorite part was watching the, the bag come up, and all that chocolate malt coming into the, uh, the brew kettle, but, you know, he has a little hoist and everything, and uh, I thought that was great. Just to, just to see that in action was, was pretty awesome, too, so. But from here, um, We'll all, you know, reconvene later on and talk about the beers, the brew day, um, just the whole experience, and uh, and then later on we'll we'll, we'll choose a, a brewer to come in and brew a big old batch with you, Brian. Yes, once we uh, make that call, who who's going to come in? We'll uh, we'll reach out and we'll talk about a recipe, figure out who we want to brew, and uh, we'll get them to come in and brew on the big 20 barrel system here behind me, and uh, we'll get that uh, first home brew how to. Draft Top sponsored beer, um, brewed up, packaged, and uh, out the tapper.